Okay, everybody, welcome to Warrnambool Library and the Kerangamite Regional Library Corporation's first online Zoom author talk. We've got conversations from the outback with Fleur McDonald and Tanya Hislop. Sorry, Hislip, my apologies, Tanya. Um, we're just letting a few more people in as they're logging in. We'll just let these couple in and then we'll continue. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Because it's got um, it's got the microphone working now. Okay, so we're going to um, mute everyone's microphones and videos while Fleur and Tanya are speaking and having their in conversation session. And then we're going to move on to a question and answer session where we'll um, be able to chat via the chat bubble at the bottom of your screen. Tanya and Fleur would love to hear your questions. So please um, send them through throughout. Sounds like we've got a couple there that might need a bit of muting and I'll get to those. So I'll just give everybody a little bit of background while we're just waiting for everyone to come in. Um, okay, Fleur, she's um, here tonight with her book, Red Dirt Country, from her rural literature series featuring Detective Dave Burrows. I believe it's number three in the series. And um, her first book, uh, Red Dust, was the highest selling novel for a debut author. In 2010, Fleur was shortlisted for the Australian Book Industry Awards um, as their debut author of the year. So far, according to my research, 15 novels and two novellas, with a um, lot of strong female characters and solid no-nonsense Aussie men inspired, inspired by tough, complex and genuine, genuine Australian personalities. I uh, believe her early writing talent was noticed by her parents and she was gifted a comprehensive writing course, uh, which she then took up when she found the time and then seriously started writing when she had her one of her newborns. So that was a <laughs> big effort for her. <laughs> and um, Tanya is um, here tonight to talk um, also about her memoir, An Alice Girl. Uh, raised on a cattle station north of Alice Springs during the 60s and 70s, studied and became a lawyer and then travelled to the Czech Republic to teach English. And um, your second memoir, An Alice Girl, tells childhood stories in Outback Australia, growing up and mustering cattle with the farm, on the farm with your family. I believe your family had um, a lot to do with um, pioneering in the cattle industry and um, work in isolation, with, which is quite timely with all the COVID things that's happening, school of the air, correspondence, school, school all those sorts of things. So we're really looking forward to hearing um, everything that you ladies obviously have got a lot to say. So um, I'll just finish letting these other couple of people in. And... I will close the screen sharing. So I'll just try. So it looks like we're going to have little boxes up the top, ladies, uh, Fleur and Tanya. So we'll just have to see how we can go with that. Now, um, so who's going to kick off first, Fleur or Tanya? Did we decide? <laughs> well, thank you, Jane. I think I've been nominated as the old, older, <laughs> older one of the cousins. So, um, Fleur's granted me that that role. So, um, Jane, thank you very much for the lovely invitation. It's very exciting to be here. It's also unbelievably difficult to think you're in Warrnambool on the coast and I'm in Central Australia in the desert and Fleur's in far southwest WA. We are all so geographically isolated but that's the joy of technology that we can all be here tonight. Um, and I think what's really exciting for me about this uh, is that Fleur and I are first cousins so 
um, hence a title, a catchy title that Fleur came up with called Cousins in Conversation, which I think is rather perfect because, as I said, Fleur and I could, we could chat for Australia together. <laughs> there are so many things we can talk about. So thank you and um, an enormous welcome, obviously, to everybody who's joined tonight. Thank you so much. I hope you're all rugged up wherever you are and that you have a nice glass of wine as well. So over to Fleur. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, Jane, and thank you, Tanya, for all of that. We, we were talking uh, yesterday, uh, Tanya and I were on the phone and we were trying to work out how we were going to go around uh, about all of this. And, and I was talking to her about some shared experiences that we had. And um, right at the back of Tanya's book, um, An Alice Girl, they talk, she talks about uh, having to go to boarding school and wearing school uniforms. And I suddenly realised that Tanya and I had even worn the same school uniforms because we'd gone to the same boarding school. We both had the same reaction to school uniforms and the same reaction to boarding school, which was we hated it. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so, absolutely right. Yeah, so and uh, and so we d I just um, thought we would just chat back and forth a little bit like we were saying before. And so Tanya, I want to know, um, for those who haven't read Alice to Prague, which is your first novel or your first memoir, they all include your family. So not all of us know you as well as what I do. So do you want to tell everyone a little bit about your family? Ah, okay. Well, um, thanks, Fleur. Well, perfect opportunity. Um, this is Alice to Prague, um, kindly published by Alan and Unwin, and I understand the Warren Bull Library has a copy, so that's exciting. And um, Jane told me you don't yet have an Alice Girl, but hopefully that will be coming soon, also published by Alan and Unwin, wonderfully. Um, and in both of these books, my family feature very strongly, and I think in part that's because I grew up very, very isolated on a cattle station and my family really were the only people in my life apart from the stockmen and governesses and people who came and went but uh, my family my my mother and my father and my younger sister and two younger brothers were like the mainstay of my life so we were a very very close unit and those early years with my family completely shaped how I looked on life and then what I went on to do um, with life, which is where Alice to Prague comes in, the first memoir, and very much being part of a, a family that talked about politics, even though we were remote and, um, and it's not as though we had access to television or newspapers easily, but my father was very interested in politics and world politics, so that definitely shaped how I, I thought. and. Um, led me on the journey to Prague many years later. Mm. Yeah, Uncle Grant was um, such a, um, a feature in all of our childhoods, wasn't he? Like, um, and, and I think Alice, uh, sorry, um, an Alice girl is, I don't know whether it's a love letter to Uncle Grant or, or <laughs> what you would actually call it, um, but he was such a, um, such a staple in our, um, in our childhood and so frightening. It was yes. so frightening, very stern. So, so very, very frightening, very stern. I think that men on the land, particularly in the outback, if they didn't start out hard, that the land shaped them in order to survive there really, they had to become as tough, if not tougher. Um, and that included strategies to keep their kids alive and safe in a really, um, dangerous environment so he was he was tough and hard but for that's interesting because you and I were also talking about a shared experience of snakes so tell me tell me about your memories of snakes oh, I don't know where you want me to start with that so I guess my first one um it was uh, I had a my daughter was uh probably six months old and I lived in this little Atco hut that didn't have power and it didn't have a toilet and so it's like a donger and it had holes in the walls that I had 
uh, steel wool stuffed into to stop the mice from coming in. Didn't really matter. They always they always decided it was warmer on the inside. It was one of those really crazy places that you, you lived because you had a dream about um, getting somewhere and being farmers and, and all that sort of stuff. So you're happy to do it that little bit tough to, to get to where we wanted to go. This one particular time I heard a rustle behind me and I was on the computer doing the accounts and I turned around and saw the tail end of a dew guide going into this room that we had tacked onto the end, which is where the kids' cots were. And I was <laughs> pregnant with Aiden. Um, and so I did what all good, well, because my father-in-law, uh, my, my ex-father-in-law, um, had always said to me that I would get into a position one day where I had to kill a snake or I had to do something to protect my family. And I just went, no, I'm not. I'm just going to take them inside because that's where everything's safe. Get the dogs and the kids and take them inside. Trouble was the snake was inside. So, um, yeah, we, I did what all good self-respecting women on the land would do when they were totally frightened and rang my mum 3,000 kilometres away. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Mum said to me, what would you like me to do about that? So um, it took me about two hours knowing that Rochelle was on the table in the, in the bouncer um, and I finally, got, I finally got it. I managed to kill it underneath her cot um, and the adrenaline, like I was just shaking, the adrenaline was horrific and I decided that I'd done all I needed to do at that particular point, jumped in the ute, raced down to where the headers were going because it was um, the only decent wheat harvesting day we'd had that harvest, tore across the paddock. My ex-husband actually said to me afterwards that he thought that somebody had died the way that I was driving. Um, somebody had, but wasn't a person and I told him well I've done my job that you can get rid of it <laughs> well and 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 fair enough and I can just hear Auntie June your mum responding in that way saying well you know what would you like me to do from here because um not only are Fleur and I first cousins but um we've got a very very tiny family and Fleur's mum is my dad's sister so there was dad and Auntie June and then there was Mum, no, Mum and Uncle John, trying to get it right there. Anyhow, Dad and Mum married and then Auntie June and Uncle John married. So we've got a very, very tight family and Auntie June and Dad share a lot of those same character traits of no nonsense and, um, well, yeah, what do, you, what do you want me to do? But that's definitely one of the charms and challenges of living on the land and... Um, Fleur reminded me of that because in An Alice Girl, I've got a number of snake stories. And in the territory in Central Australia, we had king browns, which are also known as mulga snakes and they're completely deadly as well. So one of our great occasions was um, a snake coming into the kitchen at dinner time with about 20 people around the table. Um, snake crawls up onto the plates. We had a had a shovel in the kitchen because you always had a shovel nearby because snakes came in from everywhere. Uh, and dad got this shovel and went ka-chung down on top of all the food. Snake and food everywhere. And about 20 people that night um, lost their appetite and, and in any event went hungry because the food was splattered everywhere. So there were, um, there were always snakes to look out for and, and mum, who's now 81, still regularly kills probably six to 10 snakes a year because there are just so many. And luckily, even though she still hates them, she's a ferocious snake killer. So um, yeah, you don't want to be a snake and uh, around mum. But that also um, leads me, Fleur, to your book, Red, Dirt Country, which is fabulous and number three in the story of Dave Burroughs. But it takes me back to the start of your writing of rural fiction. And it's just phenomenal that you've written 15 books in how many years? I have no idea. Um, Red Dust was published in 2009. So I don't do maths, I do stories. <laughs> you've published just, you're a prolific, prolific um, author uh, and your stories are exciting and they're driven by the land they're page turning they've got that zest of crime in them you know which i love and i think you know, most most people love so what what led you Fleur, to 
to have that desire of all the things that you could write to write rural fiction with a hint of crime? Oh, well, I just love crime. And again, it's something else that Tanya and I have in common is we grew up on Enid Blyton, you know, like The Secret Seven and The Famous Five. And, you know, they, these books, I'm sure, shaped both of us the way that, because I know that Tanya really likes reading crime as well. So um, I'm sure that they have had this massive impact on the way that both we both write. Um, so I love reading um, mysteries and forensic science. I, like Michael Conley is one of my favourite writers. You know, Kathy, Kathy Rikes and um, uh, Patricia Cornwall used to be. I loved her early, earlier stuff, not so keen on her, um, her latest stuff. But I just also know that there is a lot of stories in the country that so I've got a detective friend that I met after I started writing and he's told me more than once that the, um, the so-called mafia, Australian mafia, are better off to steal cattle from the north than what they are to try and run guns and drugs. So we run around with these, you know, these stock stealing stories. Um, so I just knew that there was a heap of stories to tell. And this one particular stage, I had I'd started this comprehensive writing course that was given to me by mum and dad. Uh, must have been when who's my youngest son was eight or nine months old. And I just had this story I had to tell. My fingers got itchy and until I got it out onto the page, I, I wasn't content. And I don't know why I was sleep deprived. Yeah, you know, life was pretty tricky back then. Um, but I just had to tell the story. And um, so, yeah, Red Dust sort of just turned up and and it, I don't think it ever did what we, well, it did what we didn't expect it to do. Like it went, it went a little bit gangbusters. So, but that was just very, I think that that was very lucky timing more than anything. There's a lot of luck when it comes to the publishing industry, I think. But it was um, the start of like a kernel of an idea that you had that you've taken and made successful and you've made it your own brand, which is fabulous. And that's you know, rural fiction um, interwoven with a story, some sort of criminal story that almost always in one way or another involves stock or the land or the station. So. Um, the, the thing that I find completely fascinating is that you've been able to write 15 stories and, and you'll be writing goodness knows how many as the years go on and you don't seem to run out of ideas. So uh, it seems to me to be able to write two books a year, which is what you're now doing, you must have a great capacity just to sit down and let it flow, which um, is something that... I find really challenging. I'm sure lots of people do, you know, trained as a lawyer, it's all about, you know, perfection and you're not, you're not allowed to just free flow, um, which then makes everything very, very slow and um, cumbersome. But you seem to have this capacity to sit down and it flows. So can you give us a little insight into what you think that is, how it works for you? Nope. <laughs> No, I, I don't know. Like, I just, I just write. Yeah, people say to me, you know, how do you do it? And, and I don't know. There must be a lot of subconscious um, percolating or something that goes on in the background. You know, Tanya, you said to me yesterday when we were talking about all these really well-drawn characters and, and I, I, I don't know that I, I realise that what I'm doing. I, I just sort of write. The ideas come thick and fast. When I wrote Silver Clouds, uh, there was a little um, a story on the radio on the ABC Drive program. They were talking about some rings that had been found next to a waterhole up north. And Barry Nichols, who was the bloke that was um, telling us about this story, he was saying, I want you to text in with the paragraph, the first paragraph of these books and what these rings are about. And when he interviewed me for Silver Clouds, I said, do you remember that story? He said, yeah, I do. And I said, well, this isn't the first paragraph. This is a book about those rings. So that was all it took. So it doesn't take me very much. There was a, um, a ship that washed up. I'm not sure where it was now. I've printed the story out. There was a boat that washed up. Um, it might have been up north that um, they had nobody on it. Well, what mm -hmm. can you not do with that? <laughs> There's a story. There's a story. It is... Um 
it, it is fascinating though for most people and I'm sure there'll be people watching tonight who love to write and want to write and it's a bit of a dream to think that it's possible to, to sit down and you just have these ideas and out it comes. But from that process, you've developed, in fact, right from the word go, this very interesting character called Dave Burrows, who's now, you know, um, not only perhaps your favourite character of all your characters, but you've now started um, a series where he's the star instead of being, you know, part of uh, the story with your feminine hero heroine. So in these latest three books, he's a star. It's all about him and it's his early days. So tell us a bit about Dave. Where did he come from? Well, he was the de first detective that I, well, he was the detective that I wrote in Red Dust. And yeah, I don't know where he came from. He just turned up as a lot of my characters do. They just sort of sit there in the background and suddenly they're there. Purple Roads, I started writing Purple Roads and I needed a detective and I suddenly thought, I've already got one. I'll just bring him back into it. And then when Emerald Springs came around, that's when he suddenly got started to get this, um, this cult following. And from then on inwards, I've always, um, I've always put him into the books. People just seem to love him. I, and so my detective friend is, who used to head up the stock squad, his, squad, his name is Dave also. It, absolutely no correlation whatsoever because I had written Red Dust before I met Dave. However, we were sitting in the, we, we catch up and we talk about books and, and uh, storylines and the way that um, the stock squad would investigate and, and all that sort of thing. And we usually do this in a pub because that is the best place. And we do it maybe, you know, once a month. We haven't done it for a while, obviously, with COVID around, but, you know, that's how we, we usually catch up. And uh, we were writing, we were talking about um, Fool's Gold. I think I might have been writing without a doubt at that point, but Fool's Gold. My daughter turned up in the pub and we were talking about in Fool's Gold how he, um, Dave had tracked a goanna through the bush. And Dave, the detective, turned around to my daughter and just said, this Dave's a freaking legend. So he thinks it's all about him when it's actually not. <laughs> but all that red dirt and, and all that red dirt and everything, you know, Tanya, you've grown up with that as well and you know how much it gets underneath your skin and you want to set books there and, and set your characters there and, and um, you know, that type of thing. So tell us a little bit more about An Alice Girl where, you know, you're out in the stock camp, you're playing cattle, cattle duffers. Tell us all about that. Okay, well, I'll just pop that up again because Jane said that I should so that um, anyone who's interested can grab a, put their name on the list for when it comes into the library. Yep. Um, it's, I think um, those early years were so ingrained in my being because we had no other company. We had, my, there was my sister and my two brothers um, for friends and we had our horses and we had cattle and that was that was really it so it for us there was no other life and so within that our imaginations could just run free and we were helped along by um, a couple of things and that was in the bush as as you write about Fleur cattle duffing or cattle theft or whatever you want to call it is um, you know, it's, it's an occupation as old as time, as old as perhaps the oldest profession, but especially in Australia, where you've had vast, vast areas of land and stock that are just unmonitored. You, on a, you know, hundreds of miles of, of scrub and hills, you, you can't um, monitor all your cattle all the time. And especially back in the olden days, or even, you know, the 60s when we came to the Territory, areas weren't well fenced and cattle could wander in and out of different paddocks and properties and it was very easy for the next door neighbour to come in and for strangers to set up all sorts of uh, outside strategies to come in and steal cattle which of course happened more than you'd think and that's you know it still happens today because you write about that flur in your modern day settings but for us as kids it was absolutely fascinating. So all the songs that we grew up with were pretty much Slim Dusty ballads or um, you know, Banjo Patterson, Henry Lawson poems. And they all talked about you know, the old drovers and the cattle duffers 
And so we created games um, of the goodies and the baddies. I think kids are all drawn to goodies and baddies games. It's just innate. And um, so whenever we had people out on the station or, or friends, we'd, we'd get together, get them to join in. But we didn't need them. We could create our own. We didn't have to have cattle, but we'd gallop on our horses around the paddocks, chasing imaginary cattle. And some of us would be the goodies, which were the um, station owners trying to protect the cattle. And some would be the baddies, the cattle duffers who were trying to steal them and we could gallop for miles and miles and we had a particular paddock called the horse paddock just next to the station which pretty much we claimed because it's where the horses lived and it was just this per it was a paradise of a paddock of gullies and hills and scrub and little areas of flat and we named every part of the paddock and that was our playground and that's where we set our cattle duffer games and we could play all day um, and it, to, to this day um, one of the greatest movies I've I remember seeing and I don't know if anyone has seen it but it's called Bush Christmas and it was the early version of Bush Christmas with Chip Rafferty and Helen Greve in it um, and it was set in the Blue Mountains actually but they they were horse thieves or horse duffers and um, my best friend, Janie Joseon, growing up on School of the Air, just happened to be the daughter of Helen Greve, the actress. So that added a bit of mystique and um, mystery to it all as well. I'd forgotten that. Do you know, it must be, um, it must be in the genes, because I don't know if Mum ever told you, but she used to play Robbery Under Arms. Do you remember the book Robbery Under Arms? They yes. used to do it on their horses up through the pines at Glenroy. So that Glenroy is where um, our grandparents lived. And so Mum, I don't know if Uncle Grant did, but Mum would get on the horses and she'd gallop through the pines playing Robbery Under Arms. Now, there's a story here which... Fleur and I would just be discovering tonight for the first time. And that is Robbery Under Arms, the movie, was actually set just north of Glenroy Fleur. I don't know if, if you knew that. And Dad um, and a few other local men were extras. Um, and they, they all um, took their horses up and were, were extras. And it was all around Craddock or Hawker, which is just north of um, our grandparents' home, Glenroy. So... Your mum was probably just that little bit too young to be an extra, but I bet she was there and I bet she watched it all. And I'm sure that's where her excitement for that um, story came from. And your no, mum was a beautiful rider. Absolutely I was just beautiful. About to say that. She would, have, she would have made a great extra if she was allowed to be on there because she was the best rider. <laughs> she was. And she had this beautiful, beautiful Palomino. Do you remember... We Winky, Winky, yes, Winky, this beautiful Palomino. And when we were kids, we loved watching Auntie June ride. In fact, she came up to Bond Springs, our place, when we were kids, when we needed to start learning to ride because um, Dad was too busy and he knew Auntie June, Fleur's mum, was, was the absolute gun. So Auntie June and her friend came up to stay for a month or so and helped me and Melissa and my brother Brett start the whole process of learning to ride and she was quite a strict taskmaster as well as as you'd imagine Fleur. And I think yeah she was that. We don't call her the tough old lady for no reason. <laughs> um, that, you wrote about that in was it in an Alice Girl or an Alice to Prague that you wrote yeah, about a, those horse riding lessons with mum? Yeah in an Alice Girl yeah she and her friend Robin Pinson came yeah. up and we had a we had a great time and I, I remember I'd I'd fall off and I'd go to her weeping, Auntie June, I can't do this. And she'd say, you have to have 10 falls before you become a rider, Tanya. Now back on the horse. So yeah, there was yeah. no mucking about. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was, and that, yeah. Do you know that mum's still got the photo of Winky that's up in her bedroom, on her bedroom wall? Oh, that's yeah. so beautiful. That's, but, yeah. Well, it's, it's a wonderful, you didn't end up riding. Oh, no, I did. I did for a little while, but then, you know, I went to boarding school and then went, worked on farms and they didn't have horses, yeah. they had bikes instead. So, yeah. no, we had Starbuck. We had Starbuck and a little um, Welsh mountain pony called Sooty that was a mongrel of a thing. <laughs> As all the horses are. <laughs> <laughs> to be steered well clear of. Um, yeah. you have, I'm just I'm gonna... thinking... Oh, sorry, you go, you go. I'm going to 
ask you one more question. Yeah, I know we've been going for 20 minutes. Um, I just want you to tell us a little bit about the 60s and 70s living on a cattle station because we're talking about all these stories about horses and red dust and stock camps, but tell us what they're actually like and tell us, if, you know, you didn't, I grew up, I, I lived without power in a toilet for like seven years, but you lived without power and, and you know, isolation and no phones. I had a phone, that saved me. <laughs> well, the difference also was that you were, older and uh, I don't know whether that makes it um, better or worse but the one thing about being a kid is that you don't know any different and we had absolutely no sense that our life was unusual or different and in fact all the kids around us on other cattle stations lived exactly the same kind of lives so we you know it was completely normal that um, you'd be isolated um, you, the children, uh, would become the stable permanent part of the workforce because you were there and you could all ride and you had to learn to ride and you all started to work as soon as you, you know, could work, going out on bore runs and helping fix fences and fix troughs and work in the yard and push cattle up and load cattle and then ride and start mustering and then go into the stock camp. And that, that was considered absolutely the norm for all bush kids and all bush kids around us did it. Um, and also, being the 60s and the 70s, the stockmen that came and went were very often drifters and loners, a bit like the characters out of Banjo Patterson and you know, Henry Lawson. And they, they were all single, they'd be usually bow-legged, they didn't talk a lot, taciturn, um, loved their horses and their stock. And so they, when they were there, um, they were wonderful and of course we kids adored them and trailed around after them because they were the most exciting thing in our lives but they came and they went so what I do remember from a very young age is knowing that there was no escape as a child from work so work work was the norm and work was um, non-negotiable and some of it um, I really hated because I was actually a bookish kid and I'd much prefer to be back reading and writing than stuck on a horse and on the tail of a mob in the stinking heat with ball dust everywhere and flies and um, and perishing from lack of water but my brother and sister loved it absolutely loved it um, they wouldn't have changed it uh, for anything I, I'm I don't, I, I mean, things are different in the bush now because you've got better roads, better vehicles, better communication. Um, but back then we had a two-way radio and that was our communication. Um, and um, mum would go to town about once a month to get supplies. And of course, the best part about that was she'd come back with these boxes of books from the School of the Air Library, which were almost entirely Enid Blyton books with a bit of Colin Tealy thrown in and some Silver Brumby books by Ellen Mitchell and so oh and of course the Billabong books which I read as I got older and so we we love these but it was definitely um those stories of other lambs that I I devoured mostly as a child because in part they were just of a world that was so different to mine but I think that is the thing about being very isolated as a kid you really don't know any different. And Fleur, it was probably the same for your kids um, growing up in that dog and they probably thought, oh, this is normal. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure they would have. Although if you ask them now, they actually don't remember, which is wow. um, quite, quite amazing because it, it's etched in my brain. Um, <laughs> because you only had a two-way radio and if you were out mustering that, how did Uncle Grant tell you what he wanted you to do if you were on horseback and where was he? Um, well, initially, in, in the early days, he was always there on horseback. Uh, as time went on, he became very strategic with so much area to cover. He thought having a plane would help. Um, and by that, this was the late 60s, and a lot of people were getting Cessnas in the bush to help with mustering. So Dad became effectively like a war pilot. He was this madman ducking and diving um, over the cattle and we'd be on the ground pushing them. So he had this great way of giving us instructions. He'd, he'd scribble notes and open the window of the plane and drop them. They'd, you know, depending on the wind, they'd end up anywhere and we kids would be galloping around trying to find these notes. They'd be saying, oh, you know, follow the cattle up the hill or round the, you know, um, mulga scrub um, to the, the left of the rocky ridge 
but that was if you could read his writing and that was if you could even find the notes. Um, and there's so, only one rocky ridge in the middle of the paddock yeah, as well. Exactly, exactly. And, and because that wasn't particularly successful, he then went on to get a loud hailer, which he installed in the Cessna. Um, so you could imagine he's flying over and the noise of a Cessna overhead is is unbelievably loud and the horses are you know nervous obviously and trying to hear his instructions over the noise of the plane was, and yeah you know, and you get this odd word every now and then and in the end we became very intuitive at trying to work out what a you know just a flip of the wing might mean or the direction he was heading it's like okay we've got to go this way um, so these were very rough and ready um, ways of, of communicating but I guess that is the, you know the bush people just tried crazy ideas whatever they thought could work mm. yeah. yeah just um I just talking of uh old books just as you were talking then I remembered an, an Edith Lighten book that I used to love called Six Cousins at Mistletoe Farm I don't know if oh, you ever read that one. Um, I never read it I never read it and you were going through all those other, all those silver brumbies and and, that. and I don't think I ever read any of them. I read the Trixie Beldons. Yeah, everything yeah. to do with history and and yeah. everything and and what Katie did and what Katie did next. Oh yes, yes. And all of those those types of books. But yeah, obviously, and Mum had this trunk in yes. um, garage of yeah, and it was like a trunk that that yes. um the girls going to board boarding school like to in in Ina Blyton's book it was a steel trunk or a, I don't know probably too heavy for, for a steel but whatever type of trunk it was and it had all these treasures inside of it, it was all of mum's old books and yes. I was allowed to go in there and get them out and um, I was only allowed three or four at a time and I think I've got them all now but as soon as I got them out I had to write my name in them they weren't <laughs> mine I had to write my name in them and, and a couple of the ones that Nana had actually have got I've got Nana's what Katie did and what Nana Heaslip's what Katie did and what oh. Katie did and that was given to her back in the early 1900s as a um as a present for, uh, like a prize for the uh, Sunday school um she must have passed some exams in Sunday school or something I can't exactly remember but it's made out to Phyllis Sneed. Oh that's so beautiful well that makes me think this Fleur um Red Jet Country and in fact your three books that are effectively sequels that this is your equivalent of what Katie did and what Katie did next this is what <laughs> Dave did and what Dave did next what do you reckon I think that's a very good analogy <laughs> <laughs> this has been fantastic well, I, I know that trunk so well because your mum had it in the cellar at Glenroy and when I was little even before you were born I'd go down and open and just open this trunk and gaze in it because I'm sure your mum said it was the trunk she used to go off to boarding school herself. Yeah, oh, it was. It and it's just full of treasures. And over in Nana Parnell's house, all of Dad's books were in that outdoor room where Nana um, in Nana's house there, and he had the Hardy Boys and oh. all that. and they go back. That, so they are those that age those age books, you know, back in the um yes. the. 40s and 50s so they've got the beautiful red covers with nothing and they're hardbacks and anyway we've got all of them and I've got huge amounts here and and oh, just every so often you just need to go back and look at them and reread them and the secret seven that have always got the black bentleys just like sneaking around in the back <laughs> and sometimes you just need to open the book and smell those beautiful old pages and that ah oh, there's I don't know what it is about the smell of old books, but it, it transports you. Well, and it totally transports me back to a time when I could just spend you know, hours hiding away with a book, which probably for most people watching tonight is one of their favourite pastimes because who doesn't love being able to hide away with a book, which does make me look at the time flare and I've seen we've, we have chatted for half an hour. As I said, you and I could, we could chat for Australia. There's so many great stories. But um, before I hand back to Jane, um, Blue, is there anything else you'd like to say about Red Dirt Country and what's coming next? Uh, so I'm just writing the sequel to, um, to what 
uh, to Red Dirt Country. There is a fairly huge cliffhanger at the end of that book, so there has to be uh, a follow-on. Um, and I'm having a load of fun doing that. I just, yeah, that's, I, I love writing that. I love, I love being able to get out in the bush and go camping and actually setting, just setting up the computer and writing while I'm out there. I think that that, um, being in your setting, that, what that you're writing about really helps, helps my writing. So yeah, um, that's, that's what I'm up to. What are you, what are your plans? Um, I have got a lot to think about. <laughs> I'm not as organised as you, but also having just put out um, an Alice Girl during this very challenging time. We couldn't go out and do any launches. Um, a lot of my time's been spent um, working out how to tell people about the story online. So that's taken quite a bit of my focus, but I am coming up with some more ideas. So watch this space. Awesome. Good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. For so Jane, are you there? Yes. yes. Can you hear me, ladies? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, first of all, thank you so much. Um, both of you just paint the most beautiful picture of um, your writing from the heart and where it's all come from. And obviously, some days of, you may think that it doesn't flow, but just the, your love of writing and books and reading and also um, inspiration from other authors. It's been a bit of a walk down memory lane to hear of... Um, all those books that I too read in my childhood and I went to boarding school and I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> um, I lasted one year, but, um, <laughs> you know, the Trixie Belden series, um, you know, the Enid Blytons, all those things of, you know, the gang going down to the pond with the magic steps into the water and all that sort of thing, <laughs> you know, the faraway tree. Obviously, what we get to experience our first reading experiences is a big imprint on us. I remember at school we used to, you know, have the school readers and you had to go and get ticked off on, you know, what you'd read and everyone had these little thin things and I was taking piles of books in like this to get marked off and I'm like six years old and wondering why no one else is reading like I am but you know obviously that's what happened but we've got some questions here <clears throat> excuse me I've got a frog in my throat um so the first question's for Fleur so I'll spotlight Fleur um it's from Anne and she says I'm really curious about how you wrote the books with a new baby and little kids do you write in little bits at a time and has your writing style changed over time? Um, I don't actually know how I wrote uh, with the kids. I, like I said, I just had itchy fingers and I had to get it out. I spent a lot of time writing when we were, when I was shifting sheep. So like I'd hand write um, and, you know, while we're shifting sheep down a laneway or, or something like that. I used to just snatch times when I, I could get it. I... Um, I also was very well known for just going up to the house for five seconds, I'll be back in a minute, and standing at the computer thinking, I've just had this idea, I've just got to write it down. Uh, and then a half an hour later, get a very terse uh, two-way call, like, are you coming back here to the cattle yards? It's like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> so, but um, I don't know if my writing style's changed or not. I, I... I'm a re I'm very hard on myself, and I like to improve in um, in anything that I do. So I I'd, I'd like to think that the books have got better as I've gone along because I've learnt as well. But I, yeah, that's that's up to the reader to tell me whether that's right or not. I I just I know that um, the writing part for me is probably the hardest part whereas I love the editing because it's all down you get to play with the words you play with the sentences and just you know mold it into what you actually want it to be um, yeah so I don't know whether it's changed much or not although today I was actually going back looking at a blog that I had written about five or six years ago um, and I look at a couple of things that I've written now and I thought oh I think I've got a little bit serious in my old age might need to lighten that up a little bit. <laughs> Very good I'm sure Lucy will be happy with that answer. Um, now sorry no that was from Anne so Lucille has got a question for both of you um, were you both keen writers as teenagers or did you take to writing in your early adulthood? Now, 
We'll start with you, Fleur, and maybe you can mention a little bit about your writing workshops as well. And then yep. we'll go over to Tanya. So I've always written and I can remember being in Nana Parnell's house and reading the, um, the stories that Tanya had written on really thin little pieces, thin paper and that typed up. I guess that was on the orange typewriter, Tanya. Um, but the paper was so thin and, I, and they were the same type of stories as what I was writing, which are total plagiarisms of Ina Blyton. That was just what they were, boarding school stories. Um, and then as I went on to boarding school, I was very apt at um, lovesick teenage poetry. I was very good at that. Uh, and also, you know, I write screeds of pages back home to Nana and Papa and um, to Mum and Dad, you know, just letters. Um, so I've always written in some way. And then when I started this comprehensive writing course, that was when I worked out that I had to structure everything. And so I practiced a lot of that as well. Um, and that's sort of took me then, I, I had a lot of questions about, you know, how I wrote. And um, like I said, it's not something that I really know the answer to, but I did end up creating a writing course, which is available on my website, um, which is just flairmcdonald.com. Uh, and in the space of all good mystery writers, if you join and you buy the writing course, you get to be in a secret Facebook group with me. Excellent. Bravo. So Tanya, um, writing as a teenager, was that something that you pursued or you just were so busy on the property that you didn't have time for that? No, all my writing began when I was um, a child. So, and Alice Girl is up to age 12, after which I went to boarding school. Um, so those early years, like Fleur, I wrote prolifically, I um, mostly by hand. And then I kept using my father's typewriter, much to his annoyance. And then for my 10th birthday, I got the best present of my whole life, either before or since, which was a little orange typewriter. And then I'd type um, stories, endless stories, and they were all about bush kids having adventures mixed in with yeah, all sorts of Enid Blyton characters and settings. Um, but then I went to boarding school and I found that the analytical style of writing um, and the pressures of study, uh, it changed the way that um, I thought about writing. It, I, I be, um, History became my favourite subject and I had to learn analytical writing and then I went on to practice or to study law and practice law for many years and I found that law was just disastrous for any kind of creative writing. I don't know which is the, the left or the right side, one side's the analytical side, one side's the creative side, but my analytical side pretty much shut down that creative side. So my teenage years and adult years, um, I just... I wasn't able to write like I used to, although I journaled. I journaled and I wrote diaries and I wrote letters like Fleur did. So that's where I kept it in. And it was just then getting to a stage in my life where I had stories that I really wanted to tell. And after going to Prague, it was this longing. I had to tell the story of the Czech people that I'd met. Um, and then to capture the stories of the time here in the 60s and 70s that that drove me, but I've I've never gone anywhere without a pen in my hand. I'm always scribbling, always writing, and bit by bit, I hope I'm reversing that um, analytical versus creative side, so the creative is coming back. Very good. That's great. Uh, we've got another question here uh, from Laura B. Um, hi, Flora and Tanya. What do you think it is that makes the dry Aussie landscape a perfect and rather popular setting for fiction and non-fiction books? Well, from my perspective, um, and mine's non-fiction, um, non so then I'll, I'll answer from that perspective and hand over to Fleur for fiction. But I think, um, and in fact, Fleur and I were having a, a chat about this yesterday too, I think there's this um, sense of uh, it's the romance or the exotic nature of the inland, of the outback, that mythological outback that uh, people have grown up reading about, um, hearing poems about, stories about, but most Australian people live on the coast. Yeah. And so they either haven't been to the outback or they've only read about it. So it creates some sort of, um, I think, 
fascination. Uh, Fleur, what do you think? Yeah, I've been asked this question so often and I'm not really 100% sure what it is. Some people say it goes back to the success of McLeod's Daughters. Uh, I just know that I want to write about, and if you do look at it, there is this massive hunger for, for doesn't matter whether it's fiction or memoirs or, or what, the, where, what the story is, if it's set in, in rural areas and that in especially sort of red dirt, red dirt country, um, that, you know, it, it just seems to sell. And um, I, I don't know, I just feel that I write about it personally because I live on the coast now, but I know that area better. I love that area, like in the Northern Flinders Ranges where uh, I grew up. That's what I, you know, that's where I set most of my present day books. Um, and I just, I just love writing about it because that's what I love and it's what's in my soul. And it's also so rugged in the Flinders Ranges, it's a perfect spot for dropping bodies when you need to hide them. <laughs> Which and you think... can't do so easily in non, non-fiction. <laughs> yeah, well, it's well, if you do, you might have the cops knocking on your door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Need a good lawyer. I um, recently um, drove to Broken Hill from Warrnambool. It was like a 10-hour journey. And it, it, it was a beautiful drive. It was by myself, but um, the landscape just kept changing, even from, you know, an hour from Warrnambool and then another hour along. And the country, it was actually a really beautiful thing to do and to see so much of our country in a different way. And I think, as, as you mentioned, a lot of people don't get to experience it. And, and it's, it's that sprinkle of Aussie magic dust um, yeah. just, you know, every 30, 40 k's, it just changed again. It was, you know, eucalyptus or it was scrubby desert or it was this or that. And it's like, wow, where am I? And, um, yeah, people don't always get to experience that. And, and through these books, you know, you are painting a picture. You're taking someone on a trip somewhere they haven't been before. So I think it's fabulous. Uh, we've got a question from Annette asking, do you both still ride? Now, I think... Fleur, did you say you rode a little bit or? Rode? Um, yeah. no, I haven't ridden for years. I, I think I would discover muscles that I've long since forgotten if I tried to get on a horse these days. Um, yes. I've got friends that have got horses that I go visit and go, yep, nice to pat you and nice to smell you because there's nothing that smells better than a horse. But no, I, I had a back injury um, about two years ago and I had intended to get a horse when I got divorced, but that put pay to that. Yeah, so Tanya, <laughs> what about yourself? Um, unfortunately, we don't have horses on our property anymore, um, which is actually one of the reasons I, I wanted to capture the, the times of the 60s and the 70s where horses were the mainstay uh, of our, our workforce. It was how we got everything done. Uh, and over time, um, our property, like most other properties, have become more mechanised. Uh, and so there's a greater use of motorbikes and now better Toyotas and choppers. So we sadly don't have horses anymore, which um, I think probably started being phased out about probably in the early 2000s, which is I think the last time that I rode. But having grown up with you know, horses where we rode every day, for work and also for fun, um, for everything, uh, our, our horses were, um, you know, our best friends. So, yeah. as Fleur says, the smell of a horse is nothing like it, and that love you have with a horse is an unbelievably precious bond. So, um, even though we don't have them anymore, it's right there in my heart, and it's very easy to write about for that reason. Yeah, oh. and they're nice, soft, velvety noses too. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that smell and under the mane, just that, yep, yeah, precious. Lovely. Um, so we're getting close to time, so we'll whip through these last couple. Um, this is from Annette. Living so far from each other growing up, did you spend much time together? You obviously get on so well. <laughs> Who's going to take oh. that one? Well, not, I, well, I was... 12 when Fleur was born so I was just being sent off to boarding school so our lives never actually really overlapped 
growing up, just as I was leaving boarding school and going to university, Fleur was in school and then going to boarding school and then I was off and we lived in different states. But we always came together at Christmas time, didn't we, Fleur? And the family you know, connection um, was very strong. So, um, and Fleur would come, Fleur would come and stay with us for school holidays. And even when I wasn't, um, there were times when I, I was away at uni or working, Fleur would come and spend a lot of time with us. So I feel like our, our lives have been sort of inextricably entwined all along, although rarely in the same geographical space. Would you say that's sort of right, Fleur? Yeah, well, so because Tanya was so much older than me that she was always this glamorous cousin that was off doing these amazing things that, you know, <laughs> I, I wouldn't have ever known how to try and, you know, emulate. So, but um, certainly in the last, what, what would it be, four years, um, that we've just, I don't know, we've just have worked out all these, all these similarities that we have and these things in common. So, yeah, it's been, I think sometimes life gets so busy that you forget that you, your first friends were your cousins and, and that yeah. um, then you go back to that. And, and also Fleur and I are both the eldest, so uh, of our si respective siblings. So we we're have the trailblazers. Common as well. <laughs> we have we have we have that burden to carry that we also um have in common but yes yeah, sort of yeah. our lives our lives have changed over the last three four years maybe five or thereabouts but for both of us our lives have taken different turns and so as a result we've um yeah found found them overlapping again which is so much fun absolutely wonderful mm. and you know um the wonders of technology that you both can be so far apart and just be doing Zoom, Messenger, whatever, and, and be in each other's mm -hmm. living rooms every day, having a cuppa, having a chat. It's, it must be wonderful for you to now have that connection even deeper now. We have a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. It's very special. And I think when you're growing up, those age differences are very stark. Mm -hmm. Like if you're 12 and you're about to go off to boarding school and um, it, the differences are very, very extreme because you, you're living very different lives. But now also um, our, our lives have, have come back and reconnected. So uh, Fleur nearly feels as old as me. <laughs> <laughs> I went to the hairdresser no. yesterday. Can you tell? <laughs> Beautiful. I have to go. <laughs> I've got a very quick one here. This is for Tanya. This is interesting. Um, I can't tell who it's from, I'm sorry, but it says, Tanya, I recently returned to Victoria after having lived in Alice Springs for over 13 years. We visited mm -hmm. Bond Springs and also saw the, through the room that we used for your school days. I oh. eagerly looking forward to reading an Alice Girl. Just listening to you and Fleur talking makes me very excited about that. So um, Bond Springs? Oh, that's just absolutely wonderful. Bond Springs, that's the name of our station that I write about. And I write at length about our schoolroom. And in fact, there's two photographs in, in an Alice Girl of um, the school. In fact, I think there are three. Um, and I'm there with my sister and brother and our long-suffering governess. Um, and we've... Oh, and there's... There's a, there's a, um, I think a photograph of the school room itself. So it's tiny. It's just this little stone building, but that's oh, very on. exciting. I'll just try and spotlight a picture up. Can we get that? Um, nearly, nearly, nearly. Um, you have to turn that, that it, that's mum when she was a governess. If you turn, I'll just, um, keep going, keep going, keep going. Oh, you're getting very close. Um, if you if you get keep going, thank you, Fleur. Um, it's the one where on the left hand side of the picture, three pictures of we four kids. That's Mrs. Hodder. So a little bit more, a little bit more. On the the left hand page is just we four. Yep, that's it. That's it. Perfect. So that's the schoolroom up the top, and if you lift it up just a tiny bit, Fleur. Uh, yes, we're there with our governess, my brother, at the blackboard, and a tiny bit more, Fleur. 
just up, up, yep. Thank you, and that's me doing School of the Year. So how wonderful, what a small world. Thanks, Flynn. Yes. So the last comment we've got here is from Annette, and she says, great chat, ladies. You're both brilliant women, role models in so many ways. Thank you. So we've hit the um, 8.30 mark. So we've been, you ladies have been going for an hour, which has just been absolutely wonderful. Um, I'd love to thank both of you for joining us in tonight and also um, in conjunction with Warnerbal Books. So uh, the Warnable Library, you'll be able to reserve copies of both the ladies' books. Um, come to the library. Uh, we are open, everybody. And um, or you can do online reservations. Otherwise, Warnable Books will have um, copies in store for you as well. I can't thank you both enough. It's just been fantastic. Mm. Thank, thank you, Jane. Funny. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fleur. Bye. <laughs> so I'm going to end the meeting now. So um, I'm going to make sure you um, jump on the ladies' Facebook pages. Do you have on tipping? Yep. Yep. Follow them on social media, whatever. And we eagerly await every little next instalment that you ladies um, put forward and we wish you all the best. Thank you Thank so you. much, Jane. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone.